Welcome to Catholic Feedback. I'm your host, Keith Nestor. On this podcast, we connect the eternal truths of the Catholic faith with everyday life. Send in your questions and comments to feedback at catholicfeedback.com. This podcast is brought to you by Down to Earth Ministry, a ministry of stewardship, a mission of faith, and by the generous support of our patrons. For more information, please visit downtoearthministry.org. That's down, the number two, earthministry.org. Let's get to it. Welcome to Catholic Feedback. I'm your host, Keith Nestor, and today I'm coming to you from Oakland, California, where we are at the Friary of St. Albert the Great, and I'm here with two incredible gentlemen, Father Michael Sweeney and, of course, Sean Bryan from American Ninja Warrior. You've seen him, and these two men together are in charge of this incredible ministry called the Lay Mission Project. And the Lay Mission Project is all about helping lay people understand their role in evangelizing the world and how the church can equip and send out people to do this incredible work. And I'm so thankful to be here in your beautiful studio. Thanks for having us here, you guys. You're most welcome. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of things I want to talk about today with this, with your mission and this topic. Is uh, What we do on our podcast is we connect the eternal truths of the Catholic faith to everyday life. And one of the most important things about our faith, obviously, is evangelizing people. The church is not going to grow if people aren't sharing their faith. And oftentimes we just we just take for granted that the church is always going to grow. New people are always going to hear about it. But we spend very little time, I think, trying to figure out how we're supposed to make that happen. And so that's what you guys are, are here to talk about. So um, tell us briefly about your work with the, the lay mission, the lay mission project. I'll default the father. <laughs> we want to provide actually a formation for the laity. As a Dominican, I had an eight-year-long formation. Um, and it's the formation integrating faith and life. Now, we don't, the church simply doesn't offer that sort of thing for lay people. The, um, no, most lay people can't interrupt their life for eight years and, <laughs> and get a formation. So we have to tailor something to realistically to uh, where are their circumstances right now and so on. But the, the idea of the formation uh, to integrate one's spiritual discipline, one's understanding of the tradition, a, a systematic formation in that sense, um, but and and then the experience of discerning together as a church that is in community, all of those are elements, and then a formation directed to the lay mission, which is to evangelize, evangelize not just individuals but also the culture, mm. and so that that's the vision to have well-formed uh, laymen and women who are prepared actually for the mission the church has entrusted to them. Wonderful, wonderful. Sean, how did you get involved in this? Um, that's a long story, but uh, the, the, short, the short story is that uh, I was going to the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology, um, and they really uh, focus on uh, practical um, uh, engagement with the secular culture. Um, so it's not just this theoretical degree that you get when you go there. It's really trying to be practical about it. And Father Michael was president of the school at that time that I was there. And uh, he was also on my thesis committee. And during that time, the Bishop of Sacramento asked Father Michael to put together a, a, a program that uh, we kind of shifted. He wanted a, a catechetical based program. And we were like, hey, well, what about this, uh, this idea of preparing lay people for their, for their um, calling in the world instead of just uh, forming catechists? Mm -hmm. um, and he really liked that idea. So Father Michael and I teamed up and we put together a, a program that's, uh, well, we don't like to call it a program. It's a project. project. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a hybrid of in-person and online experiences. The online is what's necessary to to make it to make it available to people who can't go to, off to a seminary for eight years. Um, but also uh, the necessity of having an in-person experience where you, where you discern together the movement of the spirit in your life and how we, how the spirit's acting in the world and how you're to engage with that. So where it's it's this three-year process that they go through, and we've gone through one and a half cycles of that right now. And the biggest problem them is that they, they don't want to stop meeting. They want more and more. They want to be fed. So, so we're, we're developing more, more um, um, uh, content for them as well. Uh, so they have this three-year project program, and then they go through, uh, and they just have, they have their community of disciples that they get to discern with and pray with and see with our Lord with in the world. Now, I mean, maybe it's an accident. I don't know. 
but a three-year plan with people gathered together, learning their faith, being equipped to go out into the world. I don't know. That kind of sounds like something familiar to our faith, you know? Uh, <laughs> exactly. Christ and, with the disciple. I mean, and, he didn't. Our, yeah, the, go ahead. the ideal size of our of our small groups is twelve. So, yeah, the <laughs> social scientists have figured out that twelve is the perfect number for adult education. They're apparently unaware of a significant precedent. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wonder where we got that idea. Uh, uh, well, so I, th I think obviously when we look at the scriptures, we see that the model for growth doesn't begin with isolated catechesis, which that's a fancy, for those of you that are thinking about becoming Catholic, I just have to translate for you. Catechesis is basically a Catholic word for learning, okay, or teaching. So we don't see in scripture this isolated learning experience where Jesus sends out the disciples individually with his instructions and then they all come back and figure out how to do this individually. No, he collects them together into this body and collectively then what? He sends them out two by two typically. So there's very much this element of community associated with this. So to me, it makes perfect sense that you know, given our culture right now, which a lot of things are virtual, that you guys are insisting that the meat of this happens in community. I love that. I mean, what have you? What kind of results have you seen from that? Besides people not wanting to stop. <laughs> well, actually, the 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 biggest the the biggest the best result, the most exciting result, is that we're really forming disciples, and that we're not just forming students or people that could regurgitate the faith. We're forming people that 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 we offer people the opportunity to encounter our Lord in one another, um, and in Scripture, and and in their local communities where they where they encounter Him in the sacraments. Um, but everyone should have this, um, but, but we don't really have an imagination for what discipleship is. Even nowadays, we don't, we, the closest thing we have is an apprentice, uh, someone who sits and learns how someone goes about doing something, not just, uh, okay, well, figuring out um, how to do this particular art by, by teaching you the skills. No, you're, you're, you're watching the master and learning his manner of approach to it. So it's it's more than just uh, learning intellectually. It's learning through nonverbal communication. It's learning through um, through just living with. So you do that with one another and learning from the master as well. Yeah, you discern together. The you know, Our faith says that the Holy Spirit is present, certainly inspires each of us, but the Spirit speaks through the people, the community. So St. Paul says, um, you are the body of Christ, you plural, and individually members of it. <laughs> and so wow. the, the body comes first. And, and this ex actual experience of the Spirit speaking through the, the, commun the communio, the communion gathered, that is essential. And, so, and yeah, so you have taken, though, that approach and tailored this around the idea of evangelization exactly. on the part of the late. Let's talk for a second about what we mean by evangelization. And I know it might seem like, well, Keith, that's a pretty generic word in the faith. But, you know, I was a pastor for a lot of years, and here's what I know. A lot of people sitting in churches think they know what the word evangelization means, mm -hmm. but not everybody lines up on it. You know, some people think evangelization is people getting together and just having a good time and, and, and enjoying each other. Other people think of evangelization as some sort of mission outreach, and some people think of evangelization in some other way. How do you guys define evangelization with this project? Oh, wow. We, we just usually distinguish evangelization from catechesis, as, and we, we put it a, a, along a, a whole line of faith formation. So evangelization, we, when we speak of it, we're really talking about the initial proclamation of the gospel, bringing the gospel to someone. And that happens through, through ver verbally, but also through the love and service in which you um, exhibit. So uh, we're, the, the Second Vatican Council of Documents says that each of us are to stand in the place of our Lord and make the church present and operative in ways in which it only can be through that person. So it is truly through each individual member of the church that people encounter our Lord, that people encounter the good news of salvation which he offers. So if it doesn't happen through me in the particular circumstances that I'm in, it's not going to be proclaimed. So yeah. there's a huge priority of evangelization there. There's another element too, and that is the word, uh, to uh, be in the culture as a leaven, as, as the council says. Uh, <laughs> as, yeah, as, as, as yeast in a, in, in a loaf of bread. But in order to sanctify the se the world of secular initiatives and to conform them to the plan of God, 
And, and so that is also a part of evangelization. It's, it's the pre-evangelization, in a sense, that uh, to uh, address the big issues in the culture that concern people um, and to understand them in the light of the church's tradition in order th uh, to prepare people for the explicit uh, evangelization, as, as Sean mentioned. That, that's, a, I think, a, an important thing to talk about because there are some people in the faith that have as the, their view we as Christians, you know, and there are some scriptures that kind of talk about this, are to just sh shut ourselves off from the world completely. And what I, what I used to see a lot of in, in, when I was in Protestantism was this desire to create like a, not a counterculture to their culture, but a completely separate culture. Mm -hmm. So for example, like, and I've noticed this difference in Catholicism, like when, if people wanted to play softball, we would have to have a Christian softball team. If people wanted to play volleyball, we'd have to have a Christian volleyball team. If people wanted to skateboard, we have to have a Christian skateboard place. And there was always, always this, um, this desire to take things from the world and Christianize them and then draw a line around them and say, this is now ours versus going out into those places and saying, let's be like you talked about, Father, be leaven in the lope. So I think that's, that's an important distinction that we have to be careful of because it's easy to fall into this trap of not wanting to deal with the opposition you're going to find out there in the world and just surround yourselves with people just like you. I, I like how Father Michael points out uh, how we get the understanding of Catholic universal from particularly that of being leaven in the world. It's being throughout and every part of. It's not just, it's not just, uh, it's certainly not circling the wagons and creating your own side community. It's just like Jesus within. did. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with that. You can have your own community, though. You, and it's important to do so because so, it's your it's 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 the way in which you encounter our Lord. Yeah. But that it, that you're missioned outward, that you're sent from that that community. Yeah. The only divisions that were permitted, it seems to me, is there are those with whom we work and pray, and those for whom we work and pray. Interesting. Together, you know, <laughs> that's the division. God so loved the world that He sent His only Son, John. The not, he didn't so love Christians or so love Catholics, but he loved the world. <laughs> and, and, and so it is the world that has been entrusted to us um, as stewards and to stand in his place. So why, why do you think we're so confused about this as a church, you guys? Why, why is this something that we can't seem to have? I mean, because if the church were a Fortune 500 company, I mean, essentially what we're talking about is spreading the good news, a.k.a. marketing, you know, <laughs> to a certain degree. Why do we seem to not get this right when it should be something so plain and obvious to us? Uh, I'll, I'll kick it off and then, then send it to Father Michael. It, it, it seems that we have a, a very bad imagination for um, what is tr the truth. And uh, we have this understanding of what is secular being militant against what is mm. holy or sacred. But that's not really not the case. Secular simply means uh, of or related to time, things that are bound by time. But things that are secular are also ordered to the human person. And the human person is sacred. It's ordered to God, created in the image and likeness of God and destined for him in eternal bliss. So if that's the case, then we need to take seriously things that are, that are secular so that we can order them rightly according to the plan of God to, to have other people encounter the, the truth, beauty, and goodness that is all around us so that we can um, encounter God in that way and live eternal happiness. Right. Most people don't know that the church invented secular. I there, didn't know that. There was no <laughs> idea of the secular in the ancient world. The, yeah, but we used to pray pro omnia secula seculorum for ages upon ages. And as, as Sean said, the idea of the secular is that uh, ordinary, the ordinariness of life, ordinary human things are sacred. They, that is, they are, they are meant to uh, fashion a world according to the plan of God. And the only distinction, really, it's not between secular, sacred and secular the, um, at all. But the, the secular things are meant to be ordered to what is, what is divine, what is uh, in, to God himself, and to the human person, as Sean says, who stands in his image. But so... The, the church, in a certain sense, secularized culture. By, uh, so we don't see that, um, you know, if, if I'm headed to the airport and 
I have a flat tire. I don't conclude that God doesn't want me on the plane. I conclude that I should have checked my tires. In other, <laughs> in other words, the, the secular things are real things and they're real causes. Um, and But God transcends all these things, and it's the transcendence of God. The, uh, the uh, Obviously, God sustains all things in in being, but it's the transcendence of God that Christianity insisted upon. So there weren't the gods of hearth and home and so on, as in the pagan world. And so the very idea of secular is, it was a Catholic idea. And it's something we ought to claim again. <laughs> which, which is why we need to take seriously things like science. It's, it's creation and it, we, we have the vestiges of God in, in, in how we know the created world to be. So, and, and that's actually what helped um, science blossom was the church's influence in this, se- this very secular field. So likewise, in all the secular fields, we're called to be leaven in those fields because we, uh, the, our understanding which, uh, of the created realm, uh, the truth, is such that it opens the door to more creativity and to understanding things as they truly are through wonder rather than just, okay, well, here's your here's the, the, the framework in which you're working on because this is your one particular field. No, I think that we have a lot to offer um, as a church to the secular imagination. So again, I feel like there's this mindset that can sometimes exist within Christianity, within Catholicism of separation, mm-hmm. you know, and, that, and there is in a certain sense in the scripture a call to be separate. But I think what you guys are saying is that call to be separate isn't really necessarily a, a physical calling as much as it is a spiritual calling of devotion. Mm-hmm. We're separated from the values and morals of the world, depart from God, but we were never meant to withdraw from the world in a, in a way that creates this chasm where now our faith doesn't impact the world. As a matter of fact, in the course in uh, the Second Vatican Council, the Magentium, uh, the Holy Spirit speaking through the Council, instructs us that uh, by our baptism, we were appointed to the apostolate by our Lord himself, not by delegation. And so, and then... Mm. So in not the, by bishop, not by father. Not by bishop, by not Jesus. by father, yeah. by Jesus. The, and then in uh, the document on the laity, Apostolicum Actuositatum is the Latin name of the Second Vatican Council, it actually says there that the layperson who does not work for the realization of the kingdom here and now is useless to our Lord and to himself. It's wow. a very strong language. <laughs> you know, in other words, <laughs> woo. but <laughs> yeah, each of us, and, and, and so we govern. You, we govern in the family. We govern in, at work in the manner that we relate to people. We are to order things, and we're to order things according to the plan of God, and hence our formation. We must understand the plan of God with respect to what we're doing. The, but but this, and this is a divine call. As a matter of fact, St. John Paul, he tells us that we were to regard our work, our, the present circumstances of our life, as a divine call. The, this is where we will um, live the faith. So what you guys are talking about then is essentially what the church says is the role of the lady. This isn't some fringe thing or some special thing for a certain group or order of people. This is ultimately our mission, you know, every single person. Yes. But sometimes I think we can get locked into this idea that that's the work of the the priest, the bishop, the religious, you know, where it's kind of like, hey, that's their deal. My deal is to just come and Be pray. Holy, yeah. and you're, you're a passive recipient of the graces afforded in the sacrament, which is the the poor Catholic imagination that is, mm. is kind of the tendency of, of most cradle Catholics or most people who are just sitting in the pews. But it's it's really an active calling, something that we're called to do with the, the, the documents say, uh, where the web of our existence is woven. So if we're, if we're at Mass and we're being sent and we take it seriously, it is sent, you are sent. That's where the word Mass comes from. Ita mm-hmm. misa as you are sent. If we take that seriously and we are sent into the world, what, what are we sent to do? We're, we're sent to evangelize. We're sent to order things to the plan of God. We're sent to, to make real spiritual sacrifices um, in the world. And that, that's brought back into the Mass. That's how the, the Eucharist is the, the source and summit of, of our life in Christ, is that it's not just separated from our life. We enter into that life with that missioning, and then we come 
back to the Eucharist, offer that sacrifice. It is blessed, broken, and shared, and we receive it more perfectly as well and resent again. It's just like uh, a respiratory thing. Yeah, so the sacrifice we're offering is our work and our relationships. I love to say to people, you don't go to Mass alone. Um, even if you, <laughs> even if there's no one with you, <laughs> because you go with your coworkers, with your family, with your, and you make an offering of them to our Lord, so that you may stand in His place. It, it's, it's funny when I hear people say like, "Oh, I don't, I don't like going to that church. I don't get anything out of that mass." It's like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> that's when I feel like that hundred times slapping them around. <laughs> <laughs> What's missing if you're not there? is really the question. Well, it's important yeah. to have good worship as well. And yeah. more worship, yeah. oh, I think yes. that helps people really enter into the mysteries. So I'm not giving, giving an excuse to people who do poor worship. But uh, but yeah, it, it, what's what's the mentality mentality going into it? What's the orientation of your heart going into it? Is it what you're just trying to get out of it as, a, as an experience? Or are you really living out this this source and summit sort of thing? <laughs> well, I like the idea of, and I mean, it, it, it's, it makes perfect sense. We go to mass, we worship the living God, but there's a reason why the laity received the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. It's because we, you know, the priest isn't the only one who receives the Eucharist. We receive the Eucharist so that we can be strengthened, nourished. The power of the Holy Spirit given to the church wasn't given just to the ministerial priesthood. The, the power of the Holy Spirit is given to the body of the church underneath the leadership, of course, of the apostles. But yes. we are, I mean, if, and you can see this in Pentecost. I mean, you see... They're gathered there waiting for this promise, which is, by the way, an evangelistic promise. Mm -hmm. You will be my, my disciples to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the, my witnesses, mm -hmm. to the end of the earth. That was the Go purpose. and baptize all nations. There you go. Yes. <laughs> so, so it makes sense. So we, when we come to Mass, you know, we might feel like, well, I didn't get anything out. Well, like you talk about having a poor imagination. I think that's where that hits me, Sean. It's like... Are you kidding me? You didn't get anything out of it? I mean, you, were, you heard the word of God proclaimed. You, you offered your prayers, hopefully, if you were paying attention, you offered your prayers with all the saints to the, to the living God, and you received Jesus Christ in the blessed sacrament. What more else is there? I mean, that's everything. But now, what are you doing with it? Why do you think we're so confused about and struggling with this in general, in, let's say, just in our society, you know, North American Western Catholicism in in the 21st century. What what do you think we're struggling so much? I, I think again it goes back to imagination. The there's this dynamic tension or even militant tension between uh, the secular imagination uh, with this, the social imaginaries as Charles Taylor likes to talk about it. Maybe you could talk about that and the Catholic imagination, what we, what, what we, how we see the truth of the faith in light of all creation. And it's very different than that of the, the, the secular imagination. Yeah. There's a, a, a Canadian uh, and Catholic philosopher, Charles Taylor, he wrote a book called The Secular Age, or A Secular Age. It's that thick. Um, and, and, and maybe not, um, not something I'd recommend to everyone, but he wrote another book called Modern Social Imaginaries. Mm -hmm. And his, his question is, how do we imagine ourselves to be? What's the popular cultural imagination? Not who are we, mm -hmm. but how do we imagine ourselves to be? Because he says that we buy and sell and vote and so on, largely according to our imagination rather than according to anything else. And, and, and so, for example, we imagine ourselves, our culture does, to be autonomous individuals. So my thinking about anything social starts with me. It's I. We don't start with we. And so automatically there's a conflict with the churches. You are the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. In other words, we start with we, not with I. <laughs> and if you start with I, you won't get to we. <laughs> well, for, certainly our culture is obsessed with I. Exactly. And so that's, uh, and that shapes our imagination. So we imagine, he says, culture, uh, our culture of society to be an economy, an exchange of benefits. So I'll relate to you as if there's some benefit in it for me and you relate to me for the same reason. And if there's no longer a benefit, there's no longer a relationship. <laughs> wow. So they, like, like the woman on the plane, you should tell that story. Oh, dear, yes. Uh, um, well, the two young women, uh, I was flying, two young women behind me having a conversation loudly enough that I had to be in, involved in and I couldn't help. <laughs> so, uh, 
And one was saying to the other that she had dumped her boyfriend because he no longer fulfilled her needs. And I wanted to turn around and say, say to her, oh, please, maybe that's a good way to think about your cocker spaniel fulfilling your needs, but not another person. <laughs> <That> was, <laughs> I also thought he was lucky. <laughs> that was, <laughs> got out of it. Um, but yeah, so there's that inclination, I think, again, in our culture. Everything is individual rights, individual needs. How do I satisfy myself? Then our idea of time. The secular, in the secular imagination, time is just here and now. It's what's happening. Right, we're, we're not interested in history of the past. Maybe we're interested in what we can do about the future. But time is just the, um, what's happening now. And so that we could be actually participating in the Last Supper itself, mm. sacramentally. Remember, when the priest consecrates the, uh, the bread and wine, when he consecrates the bread, he says, take eat, this is my body, which will be given for you. We actually inhabit the moment before the crucifixion, the, the passion and suffering of our, uh, of our Lord, so that we're included in it. But uh, that, that that could have any reality at all is very hard for the secular imagination. And then uh, finally, Taylor points out the fact that with the, uh, with the internet, with our media, um, we, we have the impression that uh, we can relate directly to central authority. You know, um, I, I can criticize what the president is doing as if the president were aware that I live. <laughs> but, but, and we have the sense that we can opt out that, you know, we can, um, when I'm tired of that, I can just put away the whole thing mm. uh, as if uh, that were the end of the story. But the idea of subsidiary societies, of family, of church, of neighborhood, of city, that these things um, have been compromised in a way, again, in secular imagination. And so our very idea of community has been, in a way, corrupted. The Now... If that's the secular imagination, then how are we going to address it? Good and this question. is what we're trying to, uh, and, and the church has done a lot about this in the social teaching of the church and so on. But someone has said of the social teaching, it's the best kept secret in the church. But these are the, this is what our, our laity needs in, in order to uh, talk to folks in this culture. There's just one other thing. I love what Cardinal George once said to me, and that is, you will never evangelize what you do not love. Wow. <laughs> and so if we are opposed. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. If we're opposed to someone else, or if, if the culture to us is just too disgusting, we're not going to evangelize it. I think he's right. Well, uh, at the same time, uh, our notion of love is completely out of whack as well, or our meaning the, the secular imagination. And part of that is related to the exchange of benefits thing. If, if you have an imagination for, well, I only relate to you insofar as I could get something out of you, like you would treat a cow. <laughs> um, uh, how is that? Um, where, where is the room for sacrificial love? Where is the room for um, anything that is self-gift? Where is the room for, like, if you receive anything as a gift from someone as if there's strings attached to it or as something whether or not you deserve it, um, that, that, that's not love. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of a mess and we're, we're, we're trying to attack that. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, that mindset has permeated just our culture and in terms of our faith, like what you said earlier, Sean, about I didn't get anything out of that's That is, again, starting with self as the understanding of I'm the center of the universe, God exists for me, the church exists for me, other people exist for me. And if they don't have anything that I can gain from them, they don't really exist. So what's, what's, the, what's the point, right? But evangelization must begin, I love what Cardinal said to you, mm -hmm. must begin with a, not only a desire or a recognition that I love them, but that God loves them. And when we recognize that God loves them, because sometimes it's, you know, let's be honest. Sometimes there are certain things in the culture and element that, elements of it that we might find hard to love. Well, we it's have also to remember, a God little difficult it. to love someone who just cut you off in traffic. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. I do love you. <laughs> so, I'm trying my best. Let's, let's, talk, let's talk about some practical things that 
everyday Catholics can do in this element to learn to evangelize better. And I know that you guys have a three-year mission, and I'm going to ask you to like just sort of compress that into just a couple minutes here. So I know that's not going to be the be all end all of what we're talking about, but we've got people watching this that are just getting into the faith. Some people have been uh, Catholics and Christians for a long time, but they've never really thought about this. You know, what are just some practical things? If, if you're going to compress our three year formation into, I guess, a single uh, priority, it would be to, uh, Give people the relationship with our Lord in so, uh, to the degree in which they um, see with his eyes. Mm. And in order to do that, you have to be, remain in him. Like he says in John's gospel, Abide remain in him. Like with, uh, apart from me, you could do nothing. It's literally nothing. So that's like, if you, if you really <laughs> want to be able to engage with the world, you have to remain in our Lord. In order to do that, you have to have a real relationship with him. In order to do that, you have to engage him with, in, in, uh, encounter him in the sacraments. You have to uh, regularly receive him in the word. You have to pray Lexio Divina. You have to uh, engage in the, in the community of the faithful in a way that reflects um, how you, how, how you've seen um, in light of him and get feedback from them with respect to, um, well, what, what are you called to? What's your action? It's not just staying in my own head, not just staying with my own me and Jesus experience, which yeah. is valid and good, but without that, without that connection with your, with your local discipleship community, you really don't have it. So uh, for me, the, the most essential part of it is, is being capable of, of seeing in light of revelation, seeing through the eyes of our Lord. And if, if we could do that, then, and then we're set to really set the world on fire. So two things that you said there that kind of hit me related to each other is, and here's how I'll kind of dumb that down. You can't give away what you don't have. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you have to have your own personal faith that is vibrant, alive, and is that, you know, you, you are experiencing communion with God through the sacraments, through, through all those things you mentioned. So starting with that, but then the second thing you said was, and this is related to what you said earlier you have to see the world the way God's the way God sees the world. Mm -hmm. So those things are, I don't want to just say like internal things first, but very, very personal things. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that's, that is, is key because, you know, one of the, one of the bad raps that we Catholics get, and I, you know, I spent some time not being a Catholic for a long time, like most of my life. So I know what a lot of <laughs> other Christians say about Catholics. And, you know, you could say the same thing about, about anybody really is, Boy, you know, the Catholic Church is is full of a lot of people that just don't seem very joyful. They just kind of seem like they're just sort of robotically going through the faith or they're always, you know, worried about, um, you know, trying to find a new way to suffer. And they always just seem either really grumpy or either really angry. And I just don't know if the, or just sort of bored in there. And when I've gone to mass, I look around, people are just sort of, you know, kind of not really engaged. And when I go to my Protestant friends church, everyone's like got their hands raised, they're excited, they're jumping around. So, you know, and I'm not here to critique the the interior disposition of people when they go to mass. I understand that. I think the bigger point is is your faith something that's vibrant and joyful and that you are living out in a powerful way. So starting with that, right? I mean, does that make sense, Father? Absolutely. Yeah. Our faith is not Good Friday without Easter. Our Lord has already conquered the world. We're just tidying up the, um, the aftermath. Um, <laughs> so to, it really, and to hope, and hope is confident expectation. Mm, so we like confidently that. expect to, uh, to see the world conform to the Father through the Son. The, um, and, uh, and, and therefore, we seek to see with our Lord and to discover what our interventions then should be. Um, confident, too, that the Holy Spirit will speak through us because that's exactly what our Lord promised. And so um, there, there's a marvelous place in the Scripture where uh, Jesus says to the, uh, the man, uh, born blind, do you believe I can do this? And uh, the man says, yes. This was just recently uh, at uh, one of our weekday masses. Uh, do you believe that I can do this? That's what challenges us, I think. And if we really do believe, 
and that he has given us a role in it, then um, we, I think we can take just about whatever comes. Amen. Okay, so step one, obviously, have this interior um, vibrant abiding in Christ and be, you know, be all about that and then have the mindset of, of the Lord when he looks at the, at the secular world, so to speak, or, or the outside world, the non-Catholic world. What, what, what's next? We actually found that so important that that we we are offering this on our website for all access. So not mm-hmm. just if you're in the full formation, uh, but the spiritual disciplines that go behind what we what we what we teach um, are, are available. So it's uh, seeing with our Lord is a is a um, spiritual practice that Father Michael kind of developed for the busy layperson to be able to see with our Lord. And the second would be Lexia Divina. So we have these two things that that we teach um, on how to encounter our Lord in 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 the Scriptures and and what what real place it has in your life so uh, if you just go to laymission.net you can take care of step one or or mm-hmm. you can start to take care of step one <laughs> just like that yeah. um i don't know there, there's lots of steps to step twos well yeah this is where i to the degree that it is reasonable for folks to become familiar with the catholic tradition mm. the um be, because uh the we, we have a two thousand year now uh, history of interface with civil society, of instructing, of the, the idea of the individual was in a certain sense a, a Christian uh, phenomenon originally. The, the, the individual as we now understand an individual to be was simply, d- that idea did not exist in the ancient world. But it came through our Lord, through St. Paul, and the emphasis that we place upon the integrity of the of the individual person, and so the church, in a certain sense, has shaped Western culture and more more broadly world culture now. Um, and to understand that and how it how it has, and also maybe where the culture has departed and so where it needs correction. This is uh, and so. How do we live our faith as uh, business people, as politicians, as healthcare Orders workers, as teachers? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just um, and 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 so to, to to use the church's teaching as a resource for those things. The um, I love the encyclical letters that the Holy Father writes. They're not bedtime reading ever, <laughs> but they really are instructions. Um, the and again the the church's social teaching I think is so very important um, and uh, but and and our problem is I think that uh, because as a church we haven't really had imagination for lay agency you know, what the lay people can accomplish we have in a sense not emphasized enough the the tradition or or offered a formation whereby they can do this. And this this is something that we're very much interested in trying to accomplish. So, so I guess to summarize, the first one would be uh, uh, really inculcate the faith your, uh, yourself mm-hmm. individually, and second would be to engage with the church. Whether well, that's with reading the documents, getting involved in your local community, um, and involved doesn't necessarily mean okay, you're you're doing a liturgical ministry of sort or or ministering to the sick or anything like that. Involved simply means. Uh, Develop real relationships with other with other Catholics, and and from there share with them what your experience is. Yes. So one would be have that relationship, and two would be share that relationship and discern okay. discern together. One more thing, the fundamental understanding of priesthood in the Catholic Church is not the ordination of priest and bishop; it is the royal priesthood. The priesthood is conferred in baptism. So every Catholic, the priesthood of all believers, the yeah. priesthood of all believers, every baptized Catholic is a priest, in the fullest sense. The um, and then that priesthood is distinguished with respect to service to the community, and therefore the ordination of deacon, uh, priest, bishop. The but uh, but every Catholic sanctifies, makes holy by making an offering of their life to uh, in relationships to our Lord. And every Catholic is it uh, stands in the place of our Lord uh, as uh, offering, uh, bringing the word to others. And so a priest is a mediator, and the priest is also one who offers sacrifice. 
And the fundamental Ooh. priesthood is the priesthood of the, what we call the royal priesthood. Now, that has got to get into Catholic imagination. <laughs> well, it just got into mind in the, in the standpoint of thinking about how I, as a layperson, can serve as a, and I'm using, you know, small p priest from the standpoint of offering sacrifice. So, and you mentioned the idea of having relationships, taking the faith into the world through those relationships, sacrificially loving people, and then offering your faith to them through that. I mean, to me, that's always been step two. Step one has always been get it right. Step two has been give it away. Yeah, but, but also a, a little matter of distinguishing by offering your faith to them, you're offering the faith to them. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. But that is going to come oftentimes, and this is important, at, at a sacrifice. Yeah. Because a lot of people, I think this is what trips up a lot of people, is that they are afraid to share their faith because of the negative ramifications that can take place. They can be rejected. They can um, lose opportunities. They can have all sorts of evil things said about them. And I think about what Christ said, blessed are you when people say evil things and, and, and revile you on account of me for your reward is great in heaven, you know. But a lot of us are scared to do that. But when you talked about the whole idea of the priesthood, it made me think of where have I been afraid to share my faith with someone because of what it was going to cost me? And not just in, from the mindset of like, well, just suck it up but in the mindset of let me offer myself in sacrifice for that person. And even if they reject me, even if I lose out on something because of that, I'm offering a sacrifice so that they can have the opportunity to learn about Jesus. Shake the dust off your sandals. <laughs> then, yeah, and if, yeah. And if they reject you ultimately, then, then you can do that. But I think, you know, that mindset of invitation, I mean, Catholic Catholics don't invite people to church enough. I think, I mean, that's, I think that's just something we have to struggle with is, is, why don't we do that? Why are we so, why are we so um, hesitant to extend those invitations in the world? The other thing, if when you pray for someone, it's very hard to be afraid of them or of their response. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and and so, <laughs> so, so um, I love to speak of gesture. Mm -hmm. If we really are seeing with Jesus, we see the gesture of others, and by that I mean how how each one uniquely gestures humanity. Um, I don't just mean gestures. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Not like the Italian gestures. Yeah. The, the Eucharist is our Lord's gesture to us. And so we study it. It is the, the full offering of himself. The, um, if we really want to speak to another, notice their gesture, which is to say, see them in Christ. Um, delight in it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the, and and then you'll be able to speak, the um, and you'll be able to speak with a sort of authority because you'll have noticed who they are, <laughs> the, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And 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 so there's something in our speaking itself, the um, and our and our Lord teaches us how to look. That's one of the big take uh, takeouts I think for, uh, of the Gospels. The um, how does he look? What does he see? We, we could reprioritize based on what we see him gesturing the priority to be, um, such as when someone's sinful, you don't look at them and say, you're a sinful person, I hate you, go away. Mm. No, it's you love, the, you love them and then tell them sin no more, but um, help them make amends, help them to, to um, see the love in which you're, you're, you're looking yeah. at them with. Hmm. Yeah. Reconcile, that's the, you know, St. Paul says that we have the ministry of reconciliation, yes. you know, and that idea of, that is, in essence, evangelism. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. The um, mercy is, I love what St. John Paul taught us, that mercy is a special power of love to restore relationship. So always mm -hmm. we're looking to restore relationship with others, with God. And, and to appreciate someone else in that light is uh, is to evangelize and, and when you do this you you start to develop uh, relationships of trust and when they trust you they start to trust what you're about and Amen. and they and like saint john bosco um said a lot um if if you love them they will love what you love and if they understand that they're loved they will love what you love and if you love the community of the church and you love jesus and and they understand that you truly love them and and not just in this theoretical way where like oh i love them no they have to know that they are loved and that's when you, you convince their heart.
So I don't know if that's step two and a half or one and a half, but I, th- I like what you just said there because part of this invitation has to be understood in the context of a loving relationship. Because the guy on the bull with the bullhorn outside yelling at people, you could say he's offering an invitation when he says, right. turn and burn or, or burn, or when he says, repent and believe the gospel or you're going to die. I mean, that's he's offering an invitation, but that's not really the kind of invitation that people are are drawn to because it's not cast out there in love. So if people can recognize, I love the way you put that, Sean, that that you love them, then they will eventually love what you love. Well, uh, that's t- t- talking about sacrifice, a lot of people don't want to offer themselves in sacrifice of time. Yeah. Re- developing real relationships with people is hard. Developing real relationships with people to help them see the priority of our Lord that you have and 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 to develop that trust with them. You, you have to really accompany someone along the path. If you just yell at them, they're mm. most likely not going to hear it. The, sp- the Spirit works in people in, in various ways. Maybe that's what some people need to hear at that particular time. They need to be browbeaten with the gospel. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, the thing that I've always found most effective is is loving them without limits. And when, when you do that and, you, and you're very generous and you're able to especially gesture our Lord through the generosity of time and without, without them getting the slightest hint of being perceived as someone that you look down upon, because it's very easy to, for someone to perceive that even if you give them the slightest, slightest hint that like, oh, I'm judging you for what you just did or said, they're, they're not going to go for it. But if you uh, approach them with gentleness and kindness and uh, approach them as our Lord does and you live out his gesture, as Father Michael says, then the people will start to see. Man, that's so convicting. I struggle with that, you guys, because especially when I'm talking with people often about the Catholic faith who are opposed to it and we want to they want to have these arguments or these discussions, it's ho- so hard sometimes to give the the truthful perspective without coming across as being like self-righteous or looking down on when you're saying, no, this is the truth and what you're professing is not. I mean, it's just inherent to that. And I really struggle. That's why I don't like doing debates and stuff because I almost feel like that's where that lives. Mm -hmm. But but when you're talking about evangelism, to find a way to show people that selfless, limitless love and connect that to the gospel, and they're going to feel that because let's face it, that's not common in this world. No, not at all. You know, actually, so that's a good way to distinguish yourself right there. It's not common in this world that anyone actually listens to someone else very much, period. And so if we're attentive and listen and find the story of the other person engaging, then we're way ahead. The, um, and we're offering, we're offering something they're unlikely to get somewhere else, I think. And then on, on top of that, um, who is it that said this? That if if you offer them, um, if you if you offer them an explanation of their experience better than they could articulate themselves, that's what really convinces them. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, see, uh, see um, this whole discipleship thing, <laughs> learning from the master. Yeah. There you go. I love that. I so love that. explain a little bit. A little yeah. Bit that. Um, I think everyone who lives is interested in, does my life have some meaning, significance, or purpose? Yeah. And what is it? And uh, and again, as Sean says, I think that what is what convinced me originally ab- about our Lord and the faith is that I received from him a better explanation for whom I am, for who I am, than I had from anyone else. And I think that someone is finally converts, convinced, when... Uh, they find in our Lord, in his gospel, uh, in the Christian community, a better account for their own experience than they can offer themselves. And, and so that's what we're after. That makes perfect sense because so many people have bought into this idea that your own your meaning is what you create, what you define, what you decide, and everybody's miserable. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Everyone having to, to call you by your, your preferred pronoun. And, Everything. Yes. It's And yeah, I mean, and I remember I had this conversation. It's funny you mentioned that because I had this conversation with my wife recently. We were talking about that on where this is all headed to this idea of the, the level of autonomy that our culture is after. I don't see an end to it. Like, I don't know where it stops, but, you'd th- but what everybody says is it's all about freedom and self-expression. 
But why is it that the people that I've seen that have the loudest voices that are always talking about their freedom of choice and their autonomy and all these things are also the most angry, most miserable people at the same time. Whereas in my own experience, the people that I've seen that have been more about the we than the I and more sacrificially loving, they are, they just have this peace about them. And that peace, it transcends all of this stuff in the culture. And I feel like that's, again, goes back to the first thing we said about having that abiding relationship. If you can exude that, in your own experiences, in your own relationships, people are going to be drawn to that, whether they realize what it is or not. They're just going to say, that is attractive. What is that all about? Because the more we put distance between ourselves and God, both culturally and individually, the more miserable and chaotic we become. I mean, that's just the nature of things. When I'm uh, counseling someone in the spiritual life, the, the first command that I give is that you are forbidden to judge yourself. You present yourself to God for judgment. Mm. You, we can judge, you know, when we've sinned or when we've offended someone or whatever, but you may not judge yourself. In other words, um, what you are finally capable of, what, um, uh, and so, and and the reason I think that's so important is, is that we don't name ourselves. The um, if. If I had no relationships, my name would not be Michael. It would be I, <laughs> and I'd be alone in the world. You know, the, the, um, the and the whole problem, I think, with someone who is uh, trying to be autonomous or insisting upon autonomy is that they're all the time judging themselves. They're, where am I? What have I accomplished? Uh, you know, um, and you're thinking that everyone else is judging you, and I think that everyone more, else, more so than they actually are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, everyone else doesn't care, really. Yeah. <laughs> but we do this to ourselves. The, yeah, I, I think there's something huge, and so that God is our judge is the first principle of human freedom. The, um, the, the and so judgment for a Christian is not something that we are afraid of. It's something we seek. Um, because so the next time you try to judge yourself, ask our Lord to judge you instead. Yeah, exactly. Well, was it, I can't remember off the top of my head, but was it was either in, in uh, one of John's epistles or St. Paul's epistle. I feel like it was St. Paul who said, I don't judge myself. Mm -hmm. You know, he said, it, and, and but I think it's in John's epistle where he says, if our hearts condemn us, mm -hmm. we must take notice that God who is greater than our hearts. Yes. Right? That God is greater than our hearts and he's the one who judges us. That's right. Because a lot of people feel judged in their own heart, but it's an encouragement to us to go, you know what? Ultimately, at the end of the day, I don't get to judge myself, and that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Amen. You don't get to judge me either, only God. Amen. <laughs> Which is so, why I go to reconciliation every week. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Even though I don't feel like I need it, it's like I can use that encouragement. <laughs> that's beautiful. Wow. Well, there's there's so many things that we could we could dig into, but really, what I want people to consider, you know, in their own life, is this idea of recognizing the need for all of us as lay people to own this mission that we've been given by Jesus and the church. This isn't something that you guys created. This is something that we are stepping into um, at, and this is our mission, you know? So to tell us a little bit more how people can find out about this lay mission project and where they can go if they want to get more, more involved in it. Well, if you want to know more particularly about what we do with the lay mission project, the, the best place to find it is laymission.net. That's L-A-Y-M-I-S-S-I-O-N.net. Um, and then, uh, we're, we're currently growing as a ministry and we're looking for dioceses to enter into as, as a to take on the formation as a whole. Uh, but we're also considering other implementations, uh, which, such as a couple of parishes locally as well, um, as long as they're in, in somewhat in the same area. So if you inquire, we have our information on the website on how to inquire. And uh, that, that's, that's the best way to go about it. Yeah. The, um, the but yeah, check us out on laymission.net. Laymission.net. Yeah. I'll put a link in the description of the video. Well, and we also have a, a YouTube page that we're, we're, we started up last year, but uh, we really got to start ramping it up this year. Well, I look forward to seeing more of this stuff. I think it's fantastic. And I just want to once again, thank, thank you, Sean. And thank you, Father Michael, for inviting me to come here and spend some time with you. It's been incredible. And I'm really, really excited about your ministry. As we are about yours. I, I, good. It's wonderful what you're doing. Thank you so much. <laughs> so stay with it. Yeah, right. Thank you so much. Well, friends, thanks again for joining us here on Catholic Feedback. What an incredible conversation to have today. And I encourage all of you to check out laymission.net and 
Think about what you've heard today from the standpoint of owning your faith. Make sure that it's vibrant in your life, reaching out in the world through these loving relationships, sacrificing whatever has to happen for you to love these people and share the gospel with them. And that in and of itself is gonna change the world, my friends. God bless all of you. And thank you so much once again for watching us here on Catholic Feedback. Take care. Thanks for listening to Catholic Feedback with Keith Nestor. Send in your questions and comments to feedback at catholicfeedback.com. This podcast is brought to you by Stewardship, a mission of faith, and is also supported by our team at patreon.com forward slash Keith Nestor. Please consider joining our support team. Catholic Feedback is a production of Down to Earth Ministries. For more information about Down to Earth, or to bring me to your parish or event, visit down the number two earthministry.org. See you next time.